Welcome back to the Word on Wednesday. Glad that you're all here tonight. Um, looking forward to getting back into what has traditionally been called the Lord's Prayer, but probably better called the Model Prayer or the Disciples Prayer tonight. But before that, let's begin with a word of prayer and then some attention to our prayer list. And then we'll turn our eyes back to Matthew chapter 6. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. Lord, sometimes we take for granted our ability just to get up and go. Lord, sometimes uh, our get up and go is got up and went. But Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, what we have tonight to be here. A place to be together, uh, united in your word, as, as a people of God, as a family of God. Lord, to pray for the family of God and for those to come to know and to be a part of the family of God. Lord, as we open your word tonight, Lord, may it... Uh, pierce deeply into our hearts, Lord, that we would be zealous for good works in Jesus' name. So, Lord, be with us, Lord, in our thoughts and our intents, Lord. And may everything that be said and done here tonight be in pleasing to you and in your sight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I see on the prayer list, number one, Annie Ruth Kalk mentioned here that, uh, and I'm not sure when this came about, um, it says Annie Ruth, a diabetic and COVID. So I'm not sure what's going on with her. But uh, if you know her, she's, uh, she's got the spirit of old vulture buzzard thing, and she's mean, and, but she's sweet, you know, under that veneer. And so uh, a phone call to her uh, would be much appreciated if she does have COVID uh, and something that, that's uh, very serious for a person of her age. You know, just let her know that you're thinking and praying for her. Uh, secondly, Barbara Stewart is still at home, not doing very well. You know, and in the midst of this, the, her odyssey with her health, it's, it's interesting how uh, her and my wife um, communicate back and forth. Barbara calls to encourage my wife, and though she encourages that, my wife in turn encourages Barbara at the same time. And they're both going through health you know, issues, and so uh, sometimes uh, we see that, and I just want to bring that to your attention, that even in the midst of your suffering, if you're going through a uh, painful uh, situation or circumstance sometimes it's easier to deal and to move through that circumstance by focusing on other people rather than yourself and so I think that helps both of them when they think about one another when they communicate when they commiserate and encourage one another and so remember Barbara as she continues to recover I see that Bill has modified his praise his prayer request uh, you know he'd been dealing with kidney disease for some time and so but uh, on your copy of the uh, prayer list today, it's, it just uh, simply says praise. And that praise is because diet and whatever his routine has been for the last few months have changed things in his numbers and things are looking good. They're encouraging. And so he wants to be sure to let you know that you can be, uh, you can be thankful for that on his behalf. But you continue to pray for him in that regard because this um, kidney issue is not going to go away. It's going to be there, uh, except that the Lord would take it away in, in its totality. So continue to pray for Bill in that uh, regard. You men of the men's class, uh, has he mentioned anything specifically recently? Okay. All right. So just remember him in, in your prayers. Um, uh, next, myself. Um, yes. He was at the close calls yesterday. Yep. Okay, so Cindy and he thought they had a cold over the weekend. Cindy's improvement wasn't as rapid as his, so they're, they're thinking it's not COVID but a cold. And so uh, that's why they weren't here this past Sunday. Hey, young lady. So continue to pray for Bill and also pray for Cindy as well for her recovery in that regard. Uh, myself and Debbie uh, continue to go through uh, evolving health issues and doctor screenings and things and whatnot. Uh, we went to get a an x-ray just yesterday and there's a lot of fluid on her right lung again and she's already had four thoracentesis procedures in the last six months and it looks like she's going to have to have another one soon. And uh, 28 ounces off of her lung twice um, 42 ounces and 48 ounces the other two times and this one looks as big a big not bigger 
than any of the ones we've seen before. So that fluid build up in that pleural cavity, that sac around the lungs is continuing to build up and looks like it's increasing the, you know, at the rate of accumulation. So if, as the doctor said, if they're doing it once a month, they're okay with that. But if it becomes more frequent, they're going to have to put a drain tube in, which for a person undergoing chemotherapy, any type of open wound is an infection risk. And so that's not what we want. We want that thing to dry up or at least kind of slow a little bit in what it's doing. And there's no amount of diuretics that you can use to prevent that um, because diuretics work, you know, in the outer systems rather than the inner systems like the pleural cavities or the cardio uh, cavity around the, the heart. So just pray that the Lord would be merciful to her in that regard. That would just kind of slow that down a little bit, and that would be much appreciated. She has difficulty taking deep breaths because of that because that whole cavity above the diaphragm starting to fill with fluid and so the lungs can't move like they would normally move so uh, when I tell her to take deep breaths sometimes she gets a little frustrated with me in that regard so pray for her in that in that regard um, continue to pray for Lisa as school prep continues and the school season will start real soon right so continue to pray for her. Remember that, that was some, there were some changes in school uh, through administration down through the workers. And so, you know, that dirty, f you know, five-letter word change, right? You know, so uh, anyway, uh, just pray for her in that regard. Leanne looks good. Still, still sounds a little froggy, you know, a little bit. Better than I was last couple days. Good deal. Good, good. It helps to have Sundays like we had this past two weeks, so, you know. Catch your breath. <gasps> yep. All right. Um, Patricia, what's the latest update about Patricia? I got, a in, I got a basically a text message from her saying she had an infection but ha had some antibiotics for it. Anything else about that? Okay, all right. So continue to pray for her. That's a that's a potential setback for her. So, and everything that she does, you know, it seems to be great difficulty in taking a step forward. So continue to pray for Patricia in that regard. Um, how about you? What's going on with you all and your friends and family and coworkers and whatnot? So giving her a razorback uh, valve -ee -ee, would not be acceptable, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my dad is at home. He came home Sunday afternoon. Um, he thinks his exposure was weeks before when he went to the funeral of a mutual friend. Uh, that's the only outside of his normal circle activity that he had and so he suffered through um, you know with some help of some antibiotics from his primary care physician probably through the brunt of if he was exposed then COVID and then by the time it just just didn't get any better went to the hospital and he tested positive and they shot him up with some IV drugs and sent him home and he's doing better but he's still He's never worn oxygen outside that I've seen him, but he had oxygen on the last three days that I've seen him sitting on the porch in the morning with a cup of coffee. So I can tell that he's has some distress about breathing. 
um, whether that's anxiety or whether that's just having difficulty physically. So I know that he's not better as far as recovered. Uh, he still says he has a lot of congestion, so that's not good for him having COPD and emphysema. So, but he's better. He's at home. At least he's in spirits is better than being in the hospital. You know, sometimes you go to the hospital to get well, but you can't get no rest. So uh, he's at home. The sister's at home. Um, no real uh, improvement or, you know, uh, negative thing to say. She continues day by day to continue to strengthen her abilities to, to get up and move and walk with a walker. Um, so that's a, a good thing. As a matter of fact, she's the one that went and picked him up Sunday afternoon. We were out to eat Sunday afternoon after church when I got the text message. I checked on him and got the text message that Donna was on the way to the hospital to get him. So she's able to get out and get in the Tahoe and to drive. So that's a, a big improvement from just a month or two ago. So that's good. So thank you for asking. Uh, how about other folks? Now we've got some some special singing that's coming up soon, right? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so we want to remember that. And that's a family affair. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. That's good. And that's a praise and a praise team. So that's good. Uh, I also want to say something else. There were a lot of visitors this past Sunday. And so, um, well, that's, that's a wonderful thing, considering that some of them knew me when I wasn't quite the nice person that I am today. Um, uh I didn't realize, and, and I don't really remember most of them because I was very small when a couple of the gentlemen that were back in the back back there uh, knew me exactly. As soon as I introduced myself, knew exactly who I was at one time in the past. You know those snapshots that you have of somebody that you graduated with and you remember that little s silly ears and the little, you know. I, they said, I remember you when you were that big. I said, I was probably about that big too. <laughs> you know, when I was that tall, and uh, also brought up some rather embarrassing things, antics that I got into at the same time, so, but if they come back, they'll be brave, just like I said, so, but, but it's very good to see them, and, you know, we've gotten into more of a, um, not a relaxed mode, but, you know, I was thinking, you know, it really would be nice to begin to record uh, our visitors again and when COVID first came we took all the pew bibles out we took all the written materials out all the pencils and and slowly we're coming back now I can see there's some pew bibles in front of you and in the ends over here there's envelopes that are there now and then I keep forgetting it because I can't see them from up here right and so I, now that I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get back into okay if you're a visitor you know, what we used to do is, is we used to pass a plate, right? And we would say, if you're a guest or a visitor today, we require nothing other than it's a visitor card to record your attendance. And if there's something that we can pray for you, when the plate passes, just put it in there. Well, now that we have, this is called, literally, this is made to be called the Joash chest. And if you don't know about Joash and his chest, you can look that up in the Bible. So we've been doing this for two and a half years. And so how do you tell somebody, you know, fill out a visitor card and where do you put it, you know? And so I need, need to think through that, but it would be really nice to record our visitors and guests. And so if I don't remember that, you know, you wink at me or give me the alligator arm or something like that and hold up one and go like this in front of your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, that's one of the things that we have to struggle against as as home folks. Mm -hmm. We know where things are at, so to speak when you're home folk, 
If you grew up here or you've been here for a while, you know where the restrooms are, for example. You know where these things are or that thing is. And we forget about that as being home folk, that if you're a visitor or a guest, you're lost. You don't know that there's not a bathroom in this building except for in the basement, which you don't want to go down those steps to get to the basement. And so do our guests a great favor and mention these things. If you see them looking around or dazed and confused or deer in the headlight look, you know, can I help you? That would be much appreciated. I'm sure that if you went someplace, uh, you would appreciate that too. So, but I'm thankful for all of our guests, our visitors. Um, I'm very encouraged by that. And so uh, I hope that encourages you. And that's certainly something to praise, you know. And, and I want to say this in the right frame of mind and humility. Be careful that we think that it's something about me, ourselves, this thing called church that draws people here. Because if we begin to believe it's about the preacher or if it's about the music or if it's about Jay or it's about Leanne or it's about whatever, that's a very slippery slope that you can come on and you get a little bit bigger than your britches you know, and it doesn't fit right in the whole scheme of things. This is all about him and him alone. If people come, I pray that they come when they're led by the Spirit to this place. And I said this to Jay and Lisa, I don't believe that God calls us from something unless he also calls us to something. So whether that's ministry, out of a ministry, into another ministry, or out of a church, into another church, I believe God is in that, even in that. So if people come as visitors and guests, it could be because God said, this is where you need to go. Yeah, you know, I'm content with Rocky Road ice cream, but I can try it from Briars. I can try it from Turkey Hill. I can try it from, you know, Harris Teeter, and then I can get a better, you know, understanding of that. And so it's true that we do settle. You know, you've seen those uh, Spectrum commercials about the settlers, you know, you know, cable TV and all that stuff. We can become content. Right, exactly. Zealous for good works and good deeds, the, the scripture says. Um, like the church in Laodicea, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. That's, lukewarm is kind of like settling or content. And so if we're not on fire or stone cold, you know, there's, there's something there. So, but I appreciate all the guests and visitors, and, and it's hard for me to, to make contact with all of those people and to give them time sometimes. You know, if you see me over in a corner or in, over here with somebody and they just are there and they don't go away after a few minutes, I, I feel guilty sometimes that I'm not able to shake somebody's hand and say something to them on, on the, at the end of the service. And so... I stood over here this week, if you didn't notice, and it sort of kind of piled people up. That's okay. That's okay. I, I was trying to, I was trying to do that. I was trying, I was doing that intentionally, hoping that, you know, after a certain number of people would go, is that, okay, I need to move on along. Because if I stand right here, people can go around. And this is the place where most people go in and out over here. Used to be back in the day, way back in the day, the preacher would go stand back there. And people would go out. But when you start to get a senior church, people don't like to go out the steps on the front. So I, I'm so thankful. Anyway, long story short, I'm thankful for our vis visitors and guests. Do your best to make them feel at home while they're here. Okay? So any other prayer requests or praises? that we need to mention before we go to, to the Lord in prayer.
talk. You know, you let them, they took her out in the emergency room and they sent her home so that the other blood wouldn't be bad with the child. But, mm-hmm. um, she's struggling. What's her name? Anna. Anna Carter. Anna Carter? As in Carter Country? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes, Miss Paula. Well, you need to pay attention come this this week. What do you say? Anyone sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Amen to that. Yep. You have not because you ask not, James said. Yep. Well, we'll certainly do that, Paula. Anything else? Anyone else? So that's Bridget Kelly, right? All right. Breast cancer and chemotherapy. Not feeling well. Understandable. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay. So uh, as, I, as is our custom, uh, I'll begin us in a word of silent prayer. If you want to pray out loud, that's fine. Uh, praying silently, please do. Uh, if uh, after a few minutes we'll close out with a prayer and we'll get to Matthew chapter 6 all right let's pray Heavenly Father, Lord, we do want to acknowledge who you are as we come to you. As we will discuss here shortly, you are our Father to all of those who know Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's a loving Heavenly Father. You know what we need, as Jesus said later in chapter 6, whether it be food or clothing, what we need to live, and what we need to fight the battle, Lord, as Paul has said, that the evil one will come to us and tell us all types of things. You gave us your armor, your spiritual armor, Lord, that we would be able to withstand his onslaught, the fiery darts, as it's called in the pages of Scripture, that we might be able to stand firm. And Lord, we thank you for all of these things. For it is only you that can withstand and with bear and forbear 
uh, the onslaught of the evil one. Lord, anyone who thinks he or she is enough all in and, uh, in and of themselves, Lord, is a fool. Lord, that uh, we're never told to go pick a fight with Satan, but that we are to, in the strength of the Lord, stand our ground, that we are to resist, and we are to give you the praise and honor and glory for the strength, Lord, to endure, that we are to look, Lord, with the opportunity, Lord, uh, for that temptation, Lord, to take us in the wrong direction. We know that your word says that with that temptation that you provide a means of an escape. Lord, I've heard it phrased that when the door closes, look for the window to jump out of, Lord, when it comes to temptation. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being a God who's not uh, unsympathetic, but m very sympathetic to our needs, Lord, as frail human beings, Lord, susceptible to the wiles of the evil one. So, Lord, making provisions for that, Lord, uh, you've given us your Holy Spirit and power. Lord, uh, there's many people that are sick for various reasons, Lord, that we've spoken about tonight, whether it be cancer, whether it be kidney disease, whether it be heart ailments, whether it be pulmonary function ailments, whether it be uh, many different things, Lord, and even discouragement, Lord, depression uh, from long-term chronic disease, Lord. Uh, maybe it's not a disease that would take your life, but, man, it takes your vitality. And so, Lord, we cry out to you and ask for your help, Lord, in, in, in overcoming uh, and persevering and having patient endurance in the mid middle of all the things that we go through in daily life, Lord. We know that you're there with us, Lord, and, uh, and pr perhaps one day we'll look back and we'll realize with greater clarity how much you were there and how much you sustained and you withheld uh, us and kept us in, in your watch care. But, Lord, we pray for these. We think about Annie Ruth, Lord, at home, uh, possibly with COVID and having some diabetic problems. We think about Bill with his kidney disease. We think about my wife with her cancer and ongoing heart issues and now pulmonary issues on top of that. And we think also about uh, this young lady that was just mentioned having breast cancer and going through chemotherapy and being sick. Lord, I kind of understand a little about that. And, Lord, I do pray that you would give her an encouraging word, Lord. As I've seen your people reach out to so many others and my wife, Lord, it means a lot well, when we would take just a little bit of our time and share it with another to encourage and to give a word of encouragement. So, Lord, we thank you. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with us, Lord, throughout the week until we gathered again, that our visitors and guests would find this place to be welcoming that the word would be live and it would, uh, it would t speak to them, Lord. It would not be the words of a preacher, but it would be the living word of the living God. That our praise, Lord, whether it be in song, whether it be in the word, uh, would be uplifting and be encouraging. But, Lord, when it needs to be, Lord, that it would be convicting and that it would show us the error of our ways of thinking and the supremacy of the righteousness of God and what his word says. Lord, as we turn our eyes to the word, uh, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's prayer, more aptly, the disciples' prayer or the model prayer, and still in us, Lord, a zeal for prayer. For, Lord, that's something that's hard to do. Lord, it's not easy. Uh, Lord, it's sometimes frustrating. And, Lord, we need an encouragement, Lord, to continue to pray, even when we don't see answers to our prayers. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I failed to mention a person who has just recently called me, and uh, I was getting a text as, uh, as I was praying, which reminded me, James Carnes uh, called me today and wanted to ask that we would pray for two individuals. First of all, Brittany had um, a hysterectomy and is having some problems thereafter. And so she was back in the hospital for an emergency surgery this past Friday. And so uh, that was uh, something that was certainly near and dear to his heart. And because they're part of an extended family, uh, James wants us to pray for Brittany in that regard and also himself. Um, at the same time, Bristol broke her arm while in Newburn. And when they set the arm, it didn't get set correctly. And so they had to go back in and do that again and put pins in it this time. And so he's got, you know, the child on one hand and the wife on the other hand. And so it's difficult on him so I told him that we would certainly put him and uh, them on the prayer list and that we would also pray for them so that's James Brittany and Bristol Carnes um, their mother James mother uh, had just recently came back from Castlehane Baptist and she's been attending somewhat r regularly 
here. So, uh, but the, the Sutton family from which that family comes from was long-standing members here at Lake Forest. And so they have a deep connection here. Even, even when they're living far away and members of other churches, they still continue to come home and stay in touch. So uh, remember James, Brittany, and also Bristol Carnes. Okay? Chapter 6, Matthew, uh, beginning with verse 9 through verse 15. Uh, commonly called the Lord's Prayer um, is something that many of us know. It's uh, sometimes recited in churches as part of the liturgy of a church. Um, maybe that's something that you've experienced in the past. And uh, we now transition from basically the priestly, high priestly prayer of John 17 where Jesus prayed to a more practical approach of how to pray or the practical application of prayer in our lives. So we saw what Jesus prayed for, the blessings that he prayed for us in his high priestly prayer. Now we get to look at how Jesus instructed the disciples themselves to pray. It was Luke 11, 1, where the disciples had observed for some period of time Jesus' manner of prayer, meaning his habit of prayer, and also observed him praying in some form, whether it be public or private. And they asked this question to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Though it doesn't sound like a question in English grammar, it is a question. And basically what they're asking him is, teach us to pray. And so in Luke 11 and also in Matthew chapter 6 we have what is typically called as I said the Lord's Prayer but more appropriately it would be the disciples prayer and so let's go ahead and turn our eyes back to that and read that again uh, before we move on into our study of the Lord's Prayer so verse 9 says and I'm reading from the New King James Version which probably be a little bit more in tune with a lot of people than the New American Standard Um, in this manner therefore pray Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Commonly called the Lord's Prayer, but probably more aptly the Disciples' Prayer. I keep saying that because I want you to understand this is the model that Jesus gave his disciples. So, last week we began looking through the the model prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, and we noted two distinct portions or you might say stanzas if we were talking in musical terms we might say two distinct stanzas in this prayer do you remember what we were talking about that's right so there's a division there's a division in the first two verses so verses uh, uh, 9 and 10 everything that you see in there is pointing to or focusing on God think about the the the, uh, pronouns here it says in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, pronoun, your kingdom come, that your is a pronoun, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it focuses our attention on the Father, and then everything else is your, 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 your. So we have the proper noun, then we have the pronoun that follows through that. And so there's a division there in verses 9 and 10 that accentuate the Father, is being the focus. That's the primary object of prayer. And then it breaks down into the next verses, beginning with verse 11, with the petitions or the requests. And those requests are basically for ourselves, right? Or others. So it could be for others as well as ourselves. And so that was the two divisions that were in there. And so the, the good thing to understand about this is that this provides us a model in how we ought to pray. Whatever we might say, this tells us and teaches us that we should first consider the one to whom we pray to. It reminds me of, like I said uh, twice in the last week and a half, I said twice in the last week, 
Uh, I mentioned this Christian song, this contemporary Christian song that talks about this idea about who are we really seeking and why are we really seeking him. Here's the lyrics of the song. It says, help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the savior more than the saving. Help me want the giver more than the giving. And then help me want Jesus more than anything. That's the lyrics of the song. And that model that Jesus said, when, he, when you pray, pray like this. He says, concentrate first on who it is that you're addressing. Think about who it is that you're addressing. Because I don't know about you, the tendency that I see in myself as well as a broad uh, subsection of Christian culture is, is that we don't really think about God's majesty, his magnificence, what it means to be God many times when we address God. And so just like when you were in English and you were learning how to write letters, you always began with a salutation, right? And that salutation had an honorific in it. Dear sir, dear ma'am, dear madame. It was set the whole tone for what came after that. And, it, you know, you didn't write, hey, buddy, or hey, dude, you know, or dudette. You know, that salutation and the first sentence usually set the whole tenor for the rest of the letter, right? And it's the same in prayer. How we approach God sets the tenor for the whole rest of the conversation. In counseling, I remember sometimes um, it's easy for us to forget, you know, our spouses and what they mean to us until they're gone. And I talk to many people that have marriage difficulties from time to time. And I've had my own difficulties, too. And I've discovered is that when I take for granted my spouse, that's when I'm getting in trouble. And it'll take a while, but usually it comes back around to me. It's kind of like she'll take a lot, but then there's going to come a breaking point. And when we talk about talking with God and praying with God or praying to God, he's the same way. He's the very same way. Isaiah 42, verse 8, I believe it says, I, the, the Lord is my name and I will share my glory. I will not share my glory with anyone. And so anything that we reverence, that we hallow, that we you know, revere more than God and when we hold up more important than God. And so like when we run to him like a little child and we think very impetuously that we run right in and we say, give, us, give me this and give me that and give me that. And we haven't even stopped to say, I come before a holy God, awesome, able and willing to bless his children. I come as a humble child seeking you, you magnificent, awesome God, the one who flung the stars out in the creation, who created ex nihilo without anything, the one who has all power, all knowledge. Before we, ex before we even extol him, if we come running into his presence, that can be a very an egregious thing and an offensive thing to God. Now, I know what you're thinking. When you slam your finger in the car door, you're probably not going to do all that, okay? I understand that. When you get the phone call and somebody says, you know, my baby, I think we're losing the baby, and my nephew just lost a baby, uh, his wife did, you're not going to run into the throne room of God with these great platitudes, right? You're going to say, God, help now, please. You know, intervene, be merciful, be gracious, be kind. I understand that. But just generally when we talk about prayer, how we begin that prayer and what we do in, in recognizing who we are praying to means a lot. Means a lot. Any kind of thought about that? Comments? I use the text. Well, I always have. Mm hmm. That's right. Yep. Yep. And so we mentioned that last week that Dr. Bennett taught me, and it seems that somebody else has taught Lisa and probably a lot of other people have learned the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, like the book of Acts. And so when you approach God in prayer, you begin with adoration. You extol God for who he is, not what he does for you, but who he is just in his nature. Then you go for confession, and you work through the acronym and the last one of the last things you're doing is making supplications with the S. That's what you're praying for, you know. So you're doing acts. You do adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then your supplication. And so that's a very good model in there to think about when you uh, think about prayer. 
I think J.I. Packer, you might know the name J.I. Packer, he draws attention in one of his books to this, and he says this. He says, the Lord's Prayer requires reference to a spectrum of seven distinct activities. And I'm not going to list them all. He lists the first one. He says, the first one that he mentions about seven distinct activities uh, that which must be thought about in prayer is approaching God in adoration and trust. Number one. Approaching God in adoration and trust. Hence, the things that we do in prayer, we must recognize him first. Again, that goes back to that song, Help Me Want the Healer More Than the Healing. Uh, A.W. Pink, you might know that name, also wrote about this same thing. He said, all real prayer ought to begin with a devout contemplation and to express an acknowledgement of the name of God and of his blessed perfections. We should draw near unto the throne of grace with suitable apprehensions of God's sovereignty, majesty, and power, yet with a holy confidence in his fatherly goodness. Now, that might sound a little old in the language, and it is, the turn of the century, 1900s, okay? But A.W. Pink hit it right on the head. When he said that we must... We must have suitable apprehensions of God's sovereignty, majesty, and power. What he means is that we must contemplate, we must meditate on these character attributes or attributes of God. That's the first thing that we do. And so I don't know, how, how do you approach God? Do you think about it in that way? Do you approach him in that way? To worship him just for who he is? Before you run off a list of things that you want, you know. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Describe God holy. You are you are all of these things and I worship you. And you know, you are the maker of everything. You are my creator. Um, that's usually how I start. Yeah. How many of you are familiar with Psalm eight verse four? Turn there now if you're not. I'm betting that nobody knows it verbatim. But Psalm 8, verse 4. This is a thought that, that typically runs through my mind uh, when I'm in an attitude of prayer. So your translation might read a little bit different than the New American Standard, but the New American Standard says, Psalm 8, verse 4, What is man that you take thought of him? and the son of man that you care for him. When you realize that God don't need any of us, and he doesn't need me, he didn't need me, I don't add anything to God, I don't contribute anything that was necessary for him to be more of God or less of God, I can neither add nor take away from him, and you think about the vastness of the universe as we know it right now, and we're learning more about it, if we are the only you know, intelligent, sentient beings, and he is the God who the Bible describes him, what a wonderful thing that he would even take note of you and me. That he would condescend to have a relationship with you and I. I think about that. Somebody else? Amen. That's right. That's what the whole book of Psalms is about. Those are Psalms of not only lament, which a lot of them are, but well, those are psalms of real life that the psalmist writes, and they're meant to be sung. 
I mean, you go back through the latter Psalms from around Psalm 118, 119, 121, somewhere in there. All of those Psalms are literally sung in Jewish history. All of them. Psalms of ascent, uh, going into the temple, going up to Jerusalem. All of those things are literally songs. And that is one of the ways that you can also prayer and praise in Psalms like that is exactly what Paul mentioned. He says in the New Testament, Paul mentions psalms and prayers in the same verse. And so those are very much attitude of worship, and you can pray through a song. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So you can have that, there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whisper sweet and low. You can do that all day long. And hopefully it shows on your face. <laughs> when somebody says, what are you thinking? And you got a sour expression on your face and you sing them, Jesus, you know, well, wait a minute, that don't line up too well. So how we approach God is important. Um, you notice that in the beginning of that prayer, it says, Say, our Father. That's a very interesting phrase because no self-respecting Jew would ever talk about God in that, those terms. And they would always say, I am son of, and they would point to a human father. As a matter of fact, when Jesus debated the Pharisees, they were asking him to give them a, a response to their question to trick him. He asked them about David and the Messiah. And the Messiah was clearly supposed to be of David's lineage. But David says of the Messiah that he, he would come from my loins, but I would worship him. And he's saying, hey, how does that work? That disconnect between the Messiah, which was supposed to be divine, and David, which was human, was such that it made it a paradox. Apparently, okay, a paradox is an apparent contradiction. It's not a contradiction. But it made it paradoxical to... the uh, the Jews and they wouldn't answer but no self-respecting Jew and no recorded literature from the early church, early you know uh, Jewish literature records them as saying and naming God as my father personally they don't personalize that and like Jay mentioned earlier the name of God was so holy that when they would write the name of God the revered name of God Yahweh when they would write it in the Hebrew text they would take that instrument and they would dispose of that instrument not to be written another word with that instrument. And so they not only revered the concept of God, but they revered the name of God as being an extension of his holiness. They were so unlike us and so separate from us that they didn't even say his name. They didn't even write twice with the same instrument that wrote the, his name. And so that leads us into the second thing, which it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let me ask you this. What's it mean to be hallowed? Sacred. Sacred. Okay. Anybody else? Pardon? Honored. Honored. Okay. Anybody else? No? So all of those things are right. Uh, it can also have this idea. Uh, it comes from the same word that we get holy. And so when we think about holy, we think about things that are consecrated or set apart that are for the Lord's, for the Lord's service. Or if there are things like instruments or uh, things that used to use in the temple, they were cleansed and supposed to be kept pure. They're supposed to be kept pure and undefiled. And if they became defiled, then they went through a ceremonial cleansing ritual. And so that's the same word, root word, that we get this idea of consecrated or dedicated to the Lord's service. And so when we think about um, this idea of uh, hagios being used and hallowed, it is 
tells us about his transcendence, how much different than he is from us. But also there's the idea of respect because things that were consecrated as being holy, they were treated differently than un other things that might be considered mundane or unclean. So for example, just a little example of this, working our way up to a more uh, increasing scale of uh, holiness, is if you think about what the instruments were that were in the temple, they had instruments that were made of gold, of silver, and of bronze. You think about that now. Bronze symbolized sin. Silver was a, a step above that, and gold was the most pure. And so when you think about those three things, the, the symbolism that's in it, so the bronze laver where they washed their hands and did the sacrifice and all that stuff, that remember, the blood was there for the cleansing of sin. But what was the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with? Gold. That's right. And so they sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice across the Ark of the Covenant, across the cherubim, across the bema seat, and everything that was layered with gold. And that Ark was in the Holy of Holies, and it was separated from everything else, and only once a year did the high priest go in to offer the sacrifice for himself and also for the people. And so we have this idea that God is different, he's separate, and he should be revered and treated differently than any and everything else in creation. The idea of hagios or holy or this idea of hallowed is also, and we mentioned this last week, revered or respected and even feared. Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon. Anybody know the title of the most famous sermon ever preached by Jonathan Edwards? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a what? A wrathful God. Our God is a God of love, but if you go read Revelation, you read Ezekiel, you find out that he is a God of wrath as well. He will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And so he needs to have a rightful respect as far as being holy and separate and different. He needs to be revered or respected, but also we need to remember how awesome he is. And that one day, wrath, and matter of fact, when you go read Revelation, the bowls that are there, those are the bowls of wrath, not the bones of wrath for all of you radio listeners, the bowls of God's wrath that are poured out on the earth. And so we need to remember that he should be feared. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Scripture says. And that's what Edward's most famous sermon from the 16th century reminded people. It, and it was actually, if you've, ever not read it that would be a good thing to read in about 20 minutes uh, to read that it's online you can find it everywhere so so these are the things that we opened up with and these are the things that I just wanted to recap because last week we didn't record I hope you got a little bit more as far as the depth and what we're talking about we'll continue to look at what this means to revere God uh, next week as we move on into your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven uh, af after speaking about a little bit more about hallowed be your name uh, next week. So any questions or thoughts about what's been said so far? Can you answer the question for me? Sure. I was reading, um, wasn't last night, it was the night before, about when, they, when God had told Moses to um, have him to build the tabernacle. Mm hmm Yeah, and it's the, that's right. And it's the same way with the construction of the outer court. And then, because the outer court of the temple itself, when it was brick and mortar, it was literally called the court of the Gentiles. And what were Gentiles according to the Jews? Sinful people. So the Gentiles could come into the outermost court. So it would be the largest perimeter that were around. And then inside that, there was another court, that, a wall that separated the Gentiles from the court of the Jews. So Jews were only were allowed in past that court. And then, then you had the next separation was for the priests to do their work. And then inside of that, you had the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest went in. 
And those, those are simple symbols of divisions that also go with the people that were there. So you might say sin, and then the somewhat pure, then the supposedly more pure, and then finally God, which didn't need any more uh, cleansing. It, he was just there and his whole holiness. And so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, that's good. I like it when ESPN works like that. So, so, so any other thoughts or observations, questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I, I wrote this in my morning devotional just a few mornings ago, and I'll just read it and we'll end after that if you don't have any questions. I wrote, To revere God or to hallow his name includes at least considering him for who he is. To do so, one must understand the difference between him and everything else. So we must be able to make a distinction. And, and so what we tend to do is we make God like ourselves. Isn't that how God described the idols? You make idols with ears that cannot hear, eyes that cannot see, and lips that cannot speak, and feet that cannot move. What we tend to do, and I wrote this in here, the problem that we face that is that we tend to make him more like us than he is. Therefore, we must study to better understand how and why God, even his names. He doesn't have one name. He has many names in the Bible. And we must understand how and why God and even his name are so utterly different from us. It's, not only, af it's only after we understand these differences between God and his creation that we begin to appreciate and revere God for who and what he is without regard to what he may do or may not do for us. That's when you know you really revere God. Think about it like this. How would you feel if, let's just put it in some terms, I think we're all old enough here, maybe except for one of us that not to have grandchildren. How would you feel if your grandchild only wanted to come see you because they expected to receive something from you? It might be novel at first, right? After a while, that wouldn't be appreciated very much. That's the thought I'll leave you with. So, any questions? Let's pray and we'll turn the floor over to the praise team for practice. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your person. Hallowed be your character. Lord, may we appreciate the healer. May we thank the healer more than just petitioning the healer. May we desire uh, the, the, the Savior more than the saving. And may we desire the giver himself more than the giver for what he gives. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.